and I say, I shoot people. Keep coming at me, keep coming at me. Stop. I'm a bit like uh, a eyed assassin, you know? I get a phone call, like you see in the movies. I pack the bag, I go over, and I, I shoot people. <laughs> I never stepped out to be a superstar photographer. I'm an artist who happens to use a camera. Within what I do as an artist, there is no limits. I just wanted to take pictures. His feet moved, click. And all my friends thought I was crazy, really. One shot, and I knew when I got it, and it became one of the most famous sleeves shots I've ever done. Photography, for me, is, is everything. Photography is, you know, life itself. It's an amazing medium. I don't actually sleep. I do about four hours, to be honest with you. That works for me. And then because what I do is quite international, if I'm up in the middle of the night, it means that Japan is up, so then that works for me. I never liked the idea of the look of a photographer, the bags and everything else. I just never liked it. So I always used to carry my cameras in an indiscreet bag, nothing that looked like a photo photography bag, you know? Because I, I also I use Leicas, which was... Um, very rare to use that in the, in the business, in um, sort of music photography. And it's, um, you can just drop in your pocket. And so I remember when I uh, did the first show I ever did, I took a Leica out. Everyone had Canons and Nikons and Pentaxes, and I had Leica, and they looked at me and thought, what the f is that? Skinny Girl Diet for me is um, probably one of the really exciting young female bands coming out of England at the moment. The kind of pictures that I'd like to get well, the band is to try and capture this, the energy which I think they uh, exude on stage. Hi. Hugs. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, good luck. Hi, hi, good. Hi. When you have your own studio, you know exactly what the vibe of the place is. So it's a constant in that sense. So when you hire a place, it's completely different. You know, you have to get a feel of the place. It's really like you're meeting a girl for the first time. You know? You got some of your music with you? <clears throat> well, what I look for in a band that um, I'm interested in working with is um, a certain amount of originality and a certain confidence that they have as a singer, as a, a, as a band. Yeah. Big fans of his work. I feel like he captures people's true essence in his photography. Mm. Get a little glimpse of like their aura from the pictures. Yeah. And just yeah, it's just something a lot of photographers nowadays are a bit lazy and they just want to dress you up like dolls and stuff. Whereas I just feel like Dennis's style is just like fun and it almost seems like he's got friendship with them and you can kind of feel the relationship and get a mood. So, mm. well, what if girls like look like Beyonce and play punk music? Like, what are you going to do there? Like, it's just switching <laughs> things up a bit and like just. We, we're like unique people, we're not going to be copying the past, we're inspired by exactly. that. Okay, Milo, so, okay, see what you're doing there now? So, okay, I'd say, hold that, look straight at me, and I'd say the same kind of thing. Okay, let me just see that. Let me just see. When I work with a band, I like to work when there's no okay. brief. That's cool. I like to keep okay, it that's, nice that's and nice. open. 
That way I feel I can get much more out of the band when there's no set brief. That's the way I like to work. I'm just want to give you an idea where we'll be going with it, okay? So we'll just chill out again before we start, yeah? <laughs> I was born in Jamaica, and um, I was brought over at the age of four with my mother. At that time, I suppose, people came over for a better life, really, and um, that's how it began for me. The first thing happened when I arrived, um, and the plane landed, it was winter, and as we were coming down, it said to my mother, are we here? And as I w said, are we here? Steam came from my mouth, and I thought I thought I was on fire because I'd never seen that before, and that was the first thing. And I couldn't understand why anyone would want to come to such a cold place. One of the first weeks or so, we went to the church, and um, I was introduced to the vicar. I was told that it would be great to join the choir, so I, I did join the choir. One of the things that happened to me was that they had a photographic club. But the first time I went in the dark room, I saw one of the older boys um, in the dark room. I sneaked in and he was printing, took the paper, put it into this dish, and then rocked the dish, and this image appeared. And I just thought, wow, magic, magic. And I just couldn't believe it. And from that day, I just knew I wanted to be a photographer. I was, I was smitten, that was it. I just wanted to be a photographer. I just wanted to take pictures. I remember the first time I did a print, and um, I couldn't even wait for it to dry, and I ran home and showed my mum. said, look, 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 look what I've done. And she was like, it's very nice. You know? and, uh, but I was so excited. And then, as I said, for me, that was it. The magic had, you know, had begun, and, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> Well, by the time I was um, ready to leave school, you have this thing which is a careers master. So I remember sitting with him and my mother, and uh, they said, uh, so right, Morris, so what is it you want to do, boy? And I said, I want to be a photographer. And I remember he looked at me and said, don't be silly, there's no such thing as a black photographer. And I said, yes, there is. There's like James Van Der Zee, Gordon Parks, and he looked at me like, who? We're in Cecilia Road in um, Dalston, Hackney. Across the road there is the house which I, I kind of grew up from the age of um, 11. What I did do when I got my own room, I completely blocked out the curtain, so it's that window on the left. I completely blocked out the curtain with um, uh, plastic bin liners and um, built a shelf, workbench, um, got an enlarger and turned it into a dark room. So I was constantly sleeping with chemicals around me, 24-7. Um, this spot where I'm actually standing was a telephone box, which was my office as such. And this was a number I used to give out to prospective clients. I used to literally sleep with my window open, and when the phone rang, I'd, just, I'd run down the stairs and uh, run into the telephone box and say, Dennis Morris's studio, um, and no one ever knew. I had a reputation in the neighborhood of being cheap and good. I turned uh, the living room into a temporary studio. So what I used to do is I used to pin up a white sheet on, against the wall. I would borrow a tungsten light from the photographic club, and then when people came to have their photographs taken, they would stand in front of the white sheet, and then I would do portraits, and um, that's how I earned money. How he worked within a West Indian family was, you know, I had to contribute to the household, so the money I earned, I would give it to my mother to help out, because in those days, you know, life was tough. So, you know, that's how it was. No one could understand why I was so obsessed with this thing, photography, you know. I had this nickname as Mad Dennis because they couldn't understand why I was interested in playing football or cricket or whatever. 
In those days, the style of photography, which was king, was reportage. The reportage is really about capturing the moment. Reportage is what was my influence. I would walk around with my camera constantly looking for pictures, you know, taking pictures. And so I would be inside pictures of my friends in their homes and, you know, that's how it all started. I used to do weddings, but there was this white guy with this black girl. And you could see that both families were just not into it, you know. And whatever I did to try and get a smile in the photograph, it was just impossible. It was just always this tension. But it was one of those things. Across the road there, we were at the butcher shop. It used to be the, um, the Trojan record shop which is where we used to meet on a Saturday afternoon and pick up all the leaflets to find out where all the latest dances were, all the blues dances. When you walked into the record shop, they'd always play the track, the record, before you bought it. And then you listen to it for like, uh, listen sometimes for the entire length of the, of the song. And then you say yes or no. The guy in the shop would may play maybe 10 different records and you may buy one or you might buy all 10. But it was a constant, constant playing of music all the time. So then if this was a record shop, I'd be standing here like I was a bad boy, like a rude boy, you know, listening to the tunes and stuff. <laughs> so let's start getting happy now. Ready? Yeah, 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 yeah! Reggae music was very important for the West Indian community because it was a way of knowing what was happening back in Jamaica. Because the music was a way of telling stories. It was like a newspaper. This is the site of the famous, infamous Four Aces Club. The Four Aces Club was one of the first black-owned clubs. Any of the Jamaican artists or American artists who came over to England, they'd always play at the Four Aces Club. Because all the blues dancers would start, they'd never started before 10 o'clock, and they would go until like 8, 8 in the morning. I used to go really early while they were setting up, and then that's how I would do my pictures. One of my most famous pictures, which was taken in the Four Aces Club, is of Count Shelley Sound System. And Count Shelley is one of the sounds that represented um, Hackney. And I've got this really great shot of the, the sound system with the, um, the selector. The selector is the man that would choose a record to be played, and the MC would the man be on a microphone. Like, yeah, but that, yeah, so on the steer, yeah, there, no, next tune I are, yes. And then, boom, and everyone would start rocking. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Marley was one of the first person I heard at the Four Aces Club. But Bob Marley was being played everywhere, in the body's home, not just in the clubs, you know, because Bob Marley was that universal in that way. He was the new rebel voice coming from out of Jamaica, the voice of the youth of Jamaica. And so for me, hearing that, and I was searching, you know, I was looking for a way. And when I heard his music, heard his voice, you know, I thought, wow, I want to be a part of this. So when I heard he was coming over to do his first tour of England, I, you know, I decided not to go to school that day, bunked off school, went down to this uh, club called the Speakeasy Club in, uh, it was in the West End, went and waited and waited and waited. Eventually he turned up and as, as he was walking towards me, I said, can I take a picture? And she said, yeah, man, come in. And then I went in and uh, the adventure began. And then he told me about, later, he told me about the, the tour that he was doing, he was doing, which I knew about, and asked me if I'd like to come along. And I said, yeah. So the next morning I went home. In fact, 
I went home and next morning I packed my sports bag as if I was doing PE and um, went to the hotel.